lamps were blazing. These are the sevenfold spirits of God. And before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures. Day and night, they never stopped singing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they have their being. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the sevenfold spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and grace. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down in worship. We join them in their hymn of praise as we sing our opening hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
approach the eternal throne of our Almighty God. Yet, Scripture reminds us of our unworthiness to do so. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord is righteous and we are sinful. His essence is divine, our nature is corrupt. He deserves our perfect adoration and holiness and obedience, yet we fail to give it. Therefore, come with me before God's throne of grace. Let us confess our sins together. Dear Lord, we confess to you all our sins that have ever offended you. We justly deserve your punishment, but we are truly sorry and sincerely repent of our sins. Be gracious and merciful to us for the sake of the suffering and death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Rejoice and be glad, O saints of the Lord, for God has laid on Christ the sin of us all. As Isaiah says, He was pierced for our transgressions, He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him, and by His wounds we are healed. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. This called servant of the word and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join our hearts in prayer. Lord God Almighty, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and to the day of your righteous judgment. Keep us steadfast in true and living faith and present us at last holy and blameless before you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated, and this time we'll continue with our new member wall. Dear members of Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church, uh, today David Boas, having been instructed in the Word of God and also baptized, desires to become a member of this congregation. Dear brother in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him here on earth. You have come before this Christian congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your heart to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. David, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, then answer, I do. I do. Do you believe that the teachings of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, then answer, I do. I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, be diligent in the use of God's Word and sacraments, and lead a godly life even to death? If so, then answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. I do, and I ask God to help me. And finally, will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? If so, then answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. And now, having heard your promise, we, the members of Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love. And we invite you to share in our worship and mission in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. David? Welcome to our congregation. We're glad to have you on board. Thank you. And we'll also uh, say a quick prayer. We join our hearts together in prayer. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, in mercy you join this brother in Christ to your church when he was born again of water and the Spirit. In mercy you taught him your saving truth. Grant that he may offer himself as a living sacrifice to you as his spiritual act of worship. Transform him by the renewing of his mind so that he will not conform to the pattern of this world. 
And likewise, help us live in love and harmony with one another as we work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. David, go in peace. And as we celebrate our fellowship that we have as a congregation, our, our common beliefs uh, together, we also have the joy of celebrating Lord's Supper today. Dear friends in Christ, our Lord and Savior Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this whenever you eat it in remembrance of me. And also in the same manner after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And now the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. We give you thanks, O Lord, for this foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you give us to eat and drink in the sacrament. Through this gift, you feed our faith, nourish our hope, and strengthen your life as you give us your very body and blood in love. And so by your spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, we'll continue with our celebration of the Lord's Supper. Just as a reminder of how we're doing it as we worship here in the Fellowship Hall during our remodel, uh, the usher will go up this side aisle um, and take it row by row. If you're receiving Lord's Supper today, you're invited to come up as the usher invites you to do so. If you're not receiving Lord's Supper today, you can remain seated and let him pass on to the next row. We'll line up here. You can leave the empty cups in the receptacle at the end, and you can return to your seats down this aisle. Uh, come for all things are now ready.
Now may this, the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus, and may the forgiveness that he pours out on each and every one of you through his word strengthen you and keep you firm in true faith for life, which is everlasting. You can go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Now in the peace of God's forgiveness from time and word and sacrament, we have the joy of listening to what God shares with us again this morning in his word. Today's first reading from John chapter 5 has much bearing on what we're going to talk about in our sermon today. Uh, the fact that we have an eternal past. And as we listen to these words of Jesus, notice two things. One, who is it that's going to rise at the end of time? And two, well, the Bible is clear that we are not saved because of any good work that we must do. Is it never be enough? Yet, what does Jesus say about our good works and their value at the end of time? We listen as God speaks to us here. Very truly, I tell you, this being Jesus speaking, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. This is the word of the Lord. We continue with today's psalm, Psalm 69, the Psalm of David. And in this psalm, David begins by openly admitting his own guilt over sin. Yet he goes on to ask God to protect him and all those who are righteous, that is, all those who trust in God to deliver them, whose names are written, as we'll hear in these words, in the Book of Life. Okay, some people will talk more about in today's sermon. Let's speak this word of God together. You, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. Lord, the Lord Almighty, God of Israel, may those who hope in you not be disgraced. I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O Lord, answer me with your sure salvation. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All my enemies are before you. For they persecute those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt. Charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out from the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. But as for me, afflicted and in pain, May your salvation, God, protect me. Now we continue with our second reading this morning. We find it in Hebrews chapter 10, and it's a reading that helps explain this biblical teaching of saints. Uh, saints, or 
holy ones, as the expression is sometimes translated from the first languages, they aren't just those who are special believers in some way. Rather, as the Bible talks about it, a saint is anybody who believes in Jesus. It's anybody who has been made perfect by the sacrifice which he made. We read once more. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. This is talking about those priests from the Old Testament times. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, and that priest is talking about now being Jesus, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Or, is it sometimes translated as saints? The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. This too is the word of our Lord. We'll continue with our hymn of the day. Now we can prepare ourselves to focus on God's word further in our sermon. Our hymn of the day is, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. Uh, it's in 704. That should be in an insert. You're looking if you want the sheet music to follow along, if that helps you. And we'll sing stanzas one and four.
prayer using a prayer we find in Psalm 33. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Amen. Your friends in Christ. One of my favorite sitcom characters of all time has got to be Creed Bratton from The Office. That most of what he says, if you've ever watched the show, is utter nonsense. But he once had a moment of brilliance when he was talking about the lottery. I don't get all the fuss, he said. I already won the lottery. I was born in the U.S. of A, baby. Isn't that kind of how we feel as Americans? I mean, is there any other citizenship you would rather have? I know I wouldn't. The truth of the matter is we do have it really good right now. But what happens when this kingdom finally falls, as we've been talking about the past few weeks in this series? Or at the very least, what happens when we die and our rights and privileges as U.S. citizens are effectively revoked? What then? Well, that's why we need something more also. Now, if you're Creed Bratton, his solution was to have a Swiss passport as a backup. For you and me, we have an even better solution than a Swiss passport as a backup. We have an eternal solution. We have an eternal passport. Whether it's because somebody you love has died and you're struggling with that, whether it's just that over the past couple of years with everything going on in the world, the pandemic, politics, everything going on in the country, you name it, Right? Don't you just get to a point where you realize that there's just something lacking in this place. There's always going to be something lacking here, something that no form of earthly citizenship could ever fill. And finally, that is what makes a day like today, Saints Triumphant Sunday, so celebratory. Hear from God's Word, uh, from the book of Daniel. We're going to hear him talking about a citizenship that's even better than our U.S. citizenship, as good as that is. He's going to share with us how it's a citizenship that will last. And it's something we hear as God speaks to us as we continue our series here in Daniel. Uh, today we're in Daniel chapter 12, the final chapter of his book, beginning with verse 1. We read. At that time, Michael... An angel, the Bible sometimes talks about the great prince who protects your people, God's people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book of life, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many people to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. And what we just heard in these words very much mirrors what we find throughout the rest of the Bible. Uh, if we go back to... Verse 1, we encounter this common Bible truth that we also heard about in our psalm, about a book with names written in it. And it, in its first language, this very much conveys the sense of a legal register, uh, much like you might find with something official, something like a, a book that would contain names for citizenship. And then in verse 2, we encounter another Bible truth that was mirrored in today's Gospel reading, when it says, all people. And that includes believers and unbelievers, good people, bad people, all people will awake, or you could say rise from the grave. All people will awake, and not only that, but we also see that all people have a destination, a, a passport, if you will, that determines where you will go after you die. The first destination, we're told, involves shame and everlasting contempt. When you think about it, that implies things you're doing that are wrong, things that would invite shame and contempt. In other words, it involves having sin. 
And then the second destination we hear about is everlasting life, which when you think about it, at least in the context here, would really imply that you don't have sin. Because after all, this is entirely the opposite of what the other group that would have sin, that invites contempt, would get. So we heard in verse 1, this latter group are those whose names are written in the book of life. And as we hear also in verse 3, these are those who are wise. Which in the Bible, if you're wise, if you have wisdom, that usually implies having faith. Those who are wise act in a way that is consistent with what God wants for their lives. And finally, as we're letting all that sink in, notice how this is a citizenship that confers lasting benefits at the end there in verse 3. The things that you do here in this world, at least if you have that latter citizenship, that citizenship to eternal life, these things don't just die with you. Rather, you could say they live on. They make it so that you will shine like the stars forever and ever. You know, last Sunday I, I promised a little bit more cheerful message for you this Sunday than what we talked about then, which we talked about God's judgment, which the Bible talks about. Maybe you're not quite feeling that yet. Because when you think about all that which we just heard, today's sermon hits on a basic truth regarding our existence and our eternity. It hits on the basic truth that, well, for starters, all people are going somewhere when they die. All people have an eternal passport, if you will. But what makes the difference regarding where you go, whether it's to a good place or a bad place, it's, it's sin. It helps to think about it like this. Sin is kind of like having a stamp in your passport, a stamp that would actually prohibit entry into a certain location. Uh, for example, uh, did you know that if you visit the nation of Israel and you get that stamp in your passport, there are a number of Muslim countries that you're no longer going to be able to visit. That stamp will prohibit you from entering into those countries. Now, granted, it's maybe not the perfect comparison for what we're talking about with our faith, because there are political motivations behind things like that in our world. But at the same time, it, it does kind of work when you think about it, because sin really does bar our entry from heaven. I mean, think about it. How could you really get into heaven if your sin isn't taken care of? And by that I mean, how could heaven be heaven if you're taking your sin along with you into it? Then, heaven would really be no different than our earthly citizenship here. As Americans, good perhaps, great even at times, but eventually it will all fall apart. Eventually it'll be ruined. Eventually we would die. And yes, I mean that even in heaven we would die if we carried sin with us into heaven because that's just what sin does in our life. It destroys everything it touches, right? We've seen that when we fall into sin. We see the damage that it causes. And what's even worse than all of that is we kind of want to have that stamp in our passport. We do have that stamp in our passport. Sure, we, we fancy ourselves as members of a heavenly kingdom and just assume, yep, that's where I'm going, no questions asked. But how often do we live our lives as members of the opposite uh, kingdom? As Martin Luther once eloquently put it, he said, we are both saint and sinner. And what he meant by that is we're, we're saint in the sense that Jesus has redeemed us from our sins. He's purchased and won for us an eternal citizenship but at the same time, we're still sinners. We still struggle with sin every day. We still have certain sins that we have a lot of trouble letting go of. In fact, we even have some sins that we just willingly engage in. We know we're doing them. We know they're wrong. We know they're hurting us, hurting others. And we just don't care. And why is that? It's because one sin may make me feel good. And still another sin may make me look good in the eyes of others. And yet another sin it may give me good things these good things for now. But again, with that stamp in our passport, what happens when we die? How do we get to heaven with sin? For that matter, how about our loved ones? We may just assume the best. Oh, of course they've gone to a better place. 
But can we even say that for sure? After all, were they absolutely perfect, no blemish on their paperwork, or did they too have sin? Well, I promised you a more optimistic message this week, and, and that's exactly what we're going to get right now, because all of that, it just explains fully the joys of what we get to celebrate here every week as we gather in church, and, and even more so on a day like today, Saints Triumphant Sunday. Today is a special Sunday, because think of what we just heard a couple of different times in God's Word. We heard that our sin can no longer separate us from God. We heard that our sin does not disqualify us from the book of life, which we heard about in our psalm some, even though it, it should. And the only reason that's possible is because of what Jesus has done. Jesus has done something definitive to take away our sins, to remove that mark forever. Jesus died on the cross in full payment for each and every one of our sins. And he didn't just stop with that. Jesus rose from the grave to create the hope of eternal life. It didn't exist before that. Without Jesus doing that, we would have only been left with one other option because of our sin. It would have resulted in eternal death, but Jesus would not allow that. And so, with hope in Jesus as our Savior, we can be sure that he has deleted the stamp of sin from our passport. In fact, with Jesus as your Savior, when God looks at you now, your record is so clean that he now sees you as a saint. And that is no exaggeration. That's exactly what the Bible says. And in so many different places, the Bible says, if you have faith in Jesus as your Savior from sin, you are a holy person. You are a saint in God's eyes. And that's true for anyone. That's true for your loved ones. If they have faith in Jesus as their Savior, God sees them as saints 100%. With this hope in our hearts, as we heard in our second reading, God remembers our sins no more. And that means they can no longer bar our entry from heaven. It is pure gospel. It is unconditional love. And it all comes from Jesus, our Savior. I mean, that just totally transforms the, the way we look at our futures. What a wonderful thing to, to talk about, to celebrate, to have a Sunday like today that's, that's dedicated to that simple truth. But before we wrap up things, realize the difference that that can also make for our lives here and now even as we have a different citizenship. I mean, for starters, this is why we don't want to live our lives in sin. Because with the help of God's word, we see the damage it causes. We see how it affects us. We see how that sin can overcome us in a way that we would lose our faith in Jesus, and we would lose that destination of heaven. We don't want that to happen because we know we have an eternal passport. And then, secondarily, if, if all that weren't enough, think of what we heard in our Gospel reading and in our sermon text. Through faith in Jesus, we heard that the things we do matter. We heard that when we do good things, things that God wants us to do, they're the kinds of things that are going to last. And you think about it, that is so unlike anything else in this world. Something Daniel experienced firsthand. Uh, when Daniel penned the words of our sermon text that we just read at the end of his book, by that point in his life, he had watched as the mighty Babylonian Empire, really, I, I would say, the world's greatest kingdom up to that point in time, they were dead and gone, defeated by the Persians, whom Daniel was now serving under in that government. I mean, he had watched as magnificent King Nebuchadnezzar II, whom we heard so much about in the last couple of weeks, who, who rebuilt Babylon in that magnificent way. We saw all those pictures of the city. He was dead and gone, too, about 20, 25 years by this point. I mean, this is just the way things go with earthly kingdoms and earthly kings. Sure, maybe at best a real powerful individual may leave behind a few monuments, a few pages in the history book, but I mean, how much does that really matter? How much does it matter to them when they're dead? And for that matter, most individuals, that never happens to them. Most everyone in the world history has simply been forgotten. I mean, I happen to know a lot about certain parts of my family. I know a lot going back to my great, great, 
Grandma and Grandpa Walther, who grew up in Germany, but I don't really know much more than that. And honestly, I couldn't tell you a thing about any of my other great-great-grandparents. I just don't know. So if that's the case, why would it, I expect it to be any different with my ancestors, with my great-great-grandkids? In a hundred years or so, when I'm long dead and gone and they're walking around this earth, they're not going to remember me. Because that's the way things are in this world. This kingdom will not endure. It's just not possible. And yet for Daniel, God shared with us something astounding, almost unbelievable when you think about it. He said our good works can endure. He said they can cause us to shine like the stars forever. I mean, how is that possible? Well, it's possible if our good works are connected to God's kingdom, which is all about eternal life. When our works have that as their goal, in other words, when I'm not just doing what I'm doing to help myself, or even when I'm not just doing what I'm doing to help other people, sure, but just in an earthly way, and that's all going to go away someday. But when we do things to help lead other people to eternal life, whether that's our kids, our friends, our family, our co-workers, even people we don't know well at all, when that is the object of our work, it is not in vain. So far from it, instead of that kind of work being forgotten after 100 years or 1,000 years, it will be remembered forever. I mean, think of it. How could that work ever be forgotten when there is somebody in heaven because of that work? They're never going to forget it. It's the most precious thing to them. I mean, just think of how meaningful it is when you know that a loved one is in heaven. You can begin to appreciate how precious that work is. What, what finer monument could there be in a world like ours than a monument that the sands of time cannot erode away? Because that's heaven. It lasts forever. And so as we think about that, dear friends in Christ, never stop Never stop doing good things for other people and in that way reflecting the unconditional love of a God who wants them to be with him forever. Never stop doing that. Never stop talking to other people about Jesus, about the truth of God's word, and inviting them to church. Never stop supporting the work of the church to, to bring the gospel to places where you can. Never stop. Because all people have an eternal passport. And that means that kind of work, it's, it's never in vain. And then finally, as we wrap up things today, just remember what this means for you. Remember what this means for your loved ones who have died in the faith. I mean, just think of it. Our names, through faith in Jesus, are written in God's eternal log of citizenship. And the good things we do to that end they are written across the skies of eternity. They are written with the most precious ink there is. They are written with the blood of Jesus, who died to take away every sin that you and I have. That is why we can be sure we have a kingdom that will remain. It is this future that we're waiting for. We may have it really good right now as American citizens, but we've got even something better than that coming someday. And it is this future that so many of our loved ones are already enjoying. The saints are triumphant. And we will be too someday through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Please stand. And now may this peace of God which passes our human understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus the light which is everlasting. Amen. We'll continue this morning with our confession of faith. As we've been doing throughout this series, we're going to use a confession of faith from Luther's small catechism. And we'll confess what we believe from the Bible about the seventh petition of the Lord's Prayer. In the seventh petition of the Lord's Prayer, we pray, But deliver us from evil. What does this mean? In conclusion, we pray in this petition, that our Father in heaven would deliver us from every evil that threatens body and soul, property and reputation. And finally, when our last hour comes, grant us a blessed end and graciously take us from this world of sorrow to himself in heaven. This is most certainly true.
Please be seated. And at this time, we will continue with our children's sermons. So I invite the kids to come up. It's not a race, Daniel. If you can't tell, racing is the new latest thing in the Walker household. Oh, we'll wait for you. Very good. Come on up. Good to see you. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? It is so good to see you guys here and so excited to come up. I want to talk to you about something really cool today. I'm going to show you a picture. What a, what's that a picture of? Stars. Stars, that's right. And there's some special stars on there. Did you know that when you look up at the night sky and the stars, have your mom or your daddy or your teachers told you this yet, that sometimes the stars make different shapes? In some different pictures. So what, what are those... There are two sort of pictures there that kind of look like each other. What, what do those look like? Rabbit. I think you had it, Lexi. Shoot. They look like spoons, don't they? Right, yeah, that's exactly what we call them. We call the one the Big Dipper. It's like a big spoon that you could dip and uh, get a lot of soup out of or something. And then the upper one is upside down. It's the Little Dipper. It's kind of like a littler spoon, right? It almost looks like it's, it could be pouring something into the Big Dipper, right? And the reason, now there are lots of neat images like that in the sky when you look at the stars. And you don't see the lines, you just see the stars, but it still looks like it. What's cool about these is they point to a special star. It's right there, it's on the end of the Little Dipper. We call that the North Star, it's called Polaris. And that's a really special star because no matter what, you know how the stars kind of move at night in the sky just like the sun and the moon? The stars do that too, but that star never moves. It stays in the same place, and it's almost perfectly north. So that can help you find your way around different places. Like back, back before there were computers and telephones when people used to sail on big boats on the ocean, they would look for these stars so they'd know which way to go. So they were thinking, okay, we have to go north. Oh, we better find the north star, and they could use the big and little dipper to help find it, because you notice how the big dipper kind of points at it. And then they could follow that, and they could always go north. Isn't that neat? And it always points to the North Pole. Yeah, and it, it would point you to where the North Pole is, because the North Pole is north, too. Well, you know what's amazing? In the Bible, God tells us that we can be like those stars. And we can shine forever. Because that's the thing about those stars, no matter what. Up in the night sky, those stars are always there, the north star is always there. And Jesus says we can be like those stars. We can shine forever. How can we shine forever? We have faith. That's right. And what, what do we have faith in? We have faith in Jesus, right? In our hearts, that's where the faith is, right? We have faith in Jesus. And what did Jesus do for us? Died on the cross. Died on the cross. And what, what did we take away? Our sins. And you know, we talked about this before, right? How our sins make all bad things happen, including dying. But because Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins, what's going to happen to us someday? Are we going to stay dead? No. No. What's going to happen? We're going to go to heaven. We're going to go to heaven. We're going to rise to life. You see, you know what? Jesus, he's almost like that star. As long as we're following Jesus, we're going to shine forever and ever. And Jesus is always there, just like that North Star. And you want to hear one more cool thing? Jesus says we can be like that North Star because he says the things we do, they can last forever. Now, some things we do won't last forever. Your toys and playing with them, are your toys going to last forever? No. No, they're going to go away when you die. A lot of other things you do, your job, whatever you get someday, you know, you're not going to have that forever because you'll die. But Jesus says there's a certain kind of thing we can do that will last forever. He says when we point other people to Jesus and tell them about Jesus, kind of like that star, when we point them to that star, well, will they be in heaven too? Yeah. yeah. And then they'll last forever too, just like us. Isn't that cool? So that's what Jesus meant when he said that we can shine like the stars forever, and then we can do things so that other people have this too, and we love them, and we want them to have that. What does that look like, Jesus? We'll talk about that later. All right, so let's pray about this. So let's hold our hands and bow our heads, and we pray, Dear Jesus, like the North Star, thank you for showing us the way to heaven. Jesus, like the North Star, help us show others the way to heaven. We pray this in your name. Let's say it together. Amen. All right, thank you guys so much for coming up. We'll see you later.
As we draw near to the close of our service, we'll continue with the prayer of the church. Uh, before we get into the prayer as it's printed in your bulletin, we are going to say a special prayer first. Uh, this past week, Bob's brother Rick uh, died. So we're, we're going to pray for him and their family during this difficult time. Uh, so we'll start with that, and then we'll continue with the prayer as it's printed in the bulletin. We pray. Merciful Father, how mysterious are your judgments and your ways beyond our understanding. We are grieved by this untimely death in the Tim's family, and we're troubled by it. Yet we seek refuge in your love, for you have assured us that it is more than sufficient for our weaknesses. In these dark hours, help us and help the Tim's make diligent use of your word and sacraments, so that by faith we may all be able to resist the evil foe who would seek to destroy our souls and minds and bodies. Take into your care those whose hearts and lives are so deeply affected by this tragedy, and lead them to look to you for confidence and strength as they face the future. Please sustain Bob and his family with your merciful hand, and grant them peace as only you can do. For the sake of Jesus, our mediator and redeemer. Amen. And we also pray. Lord of eternity and King of saints, all the heavens adore you. Saints and angels sing before you. We do join them to praise your majesty. You clothe us with garments of splendor. You bless us with grace and mercy in this life and eternal glory forever. What undeserved love you show us. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us your saints. Encourage us by your gracious promises. Forgive our failures to live as you desire. I strengthen the faith of all who are weak and wandering. Give us power to live as your faithful people. Your saints will triumph forever in new heavens and a new earth. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. We anticipate with joy an eternity of perfect fellowship with you and others. Be with us as we work and witness for Christ, so that many more people join Join us before your throne. Hear us, O Lord, as we take a quiet moment to think about the saints whom we love, who have gone before us, and to thank you for taking them home to be with you. day the saints triumphant will rise in bright array, clothed in your perfect righteousness. Keep us watchful until that day, when we will share fully in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, until that day, give us strength through the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, dear friends in Christ, Go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord your God with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. And we'll now close our service with our final hymn, a much beloved hymn, and I, I think I can we sing every Saint's Triumphant Sunday. Jerusalem the Golden. Uh, we'll be singing the newer version that's out of our hymnal supplement. Uh, it's in 728, it'll be on that insert in your bulletin. So if you're following with the sheet music, uh, you can use that and we'll sing all the things. Okay.
sky above those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. It's very much a passage that puts things we do in this earth into context. But a lot of people think I have to be good enough to get to heaven. Even a lot of Christians fall into that mindset. But you think about it, that's why I'm doing good works. They're not good works. I'm doing that to help myself. Maybe it helps some other people too, but I'm doing it so I get to heaven and selfishness. But the Bible's idea of our good works, God's idea is about responding. It's about being so thankful for what God's done for us that we serve him and we look to serve others simply because we love God, we love them, and we want to help. Um, what, what a beautiful truth. And what, what a neat thing to remember on St. Triumphant Sunday. We have something amazing waiting for us someday, a citizenship like no other. We've got good things to do here and now, too. And we thank God for, for giving our life such meaning and such purpose here. Because of how long I ended up making the service, we had a Wells connection. I'm going to try to save that for next week uh, when we have some activities after church during our Pride Feast. Uh, maybe we'll watch it then. We also have a, an update from our district mission board to watch, which features some of us in it as one of the mission churches in our Dakota, Montana district. So uh, we'll, we'll look to watch some of that next week. Uh, Yes, some announcements then as we go into this next week. A uh, quick reminder for those involved while the leadership team meeting today after church uh, might be a little bit longer, but I think that'll be our last one of the year. Um, and then this coming week, uh, see your bulletin for Bible study opportunities this week. Uh, we have Wednesday night Bible study at 7 as we continue to work through the book of Daniel, which we just started. We're going more in depth in our Bible studies. And uh, this next weekend, I... I, don't, I know we're not going to have any women's Bible study. I know that the ladies are in great. In fact, is there any updates on that, Heather? The sign-up sheet for our new book is in the hallway. If there are any questions about it, try me. Very good. Um, and then men's Bible study, I don't think we're going to have this week either. We'll also have a break this week, but I'll, I'll let you guys know for sure later in the week. I'll communicate with those involved in that. Um, if you're not involved in men's study, but you'd like to be, uh, just talk to me, and that way I can make sure I, I share with you. Usually we have that every Saturday, but um, somebody might be going hunting this weekend. So, uh, And then looking at uh, this next Sunday, uh, we'll, we'll have everything as normal. 9 a.m. Sunday School and Adult Bible Study. Um, we'll continue our topic on wokeness and trying to just look at that from a scriptural perspective. And then worship at 10 a.m. to we'll continue the series in Daniel. We'll have our final service. Uh, in this series. And then, uh, yeah, the big news. Next week is our longest running tradition as a mission congregation. Uh, Pi Feast IX, Pi Feast 9. Uh, so, you're invited to bring your favorite pie to share, whether that's more of a traditional pie, or a pizza pie, or a pot pie, and we'll make a lunch out of it. Uh, we do have a working refrigerator during this remodel. Uh, we do have a refrigerator in the closet there. We don't have an oven, so I know some people have brought warm things in the past. Um, we, we won't have anything here to keep that up with, other than a microwave in there. So just keep that in mind with what you bring. Um, and then during that uh, pie feast, we'll watch a couple of those video updates. We're also going to have a congregational open forum. We need to start discussing some finishing decisions for the sanctuary, the materials, all sorts of different things uh, related to that. So we're going to try to start getting a beat on that. And then uh, the only other thing, I can't remember if I shared this in a past announcement. Uh, just mark your calendars. On the 18th, we're going to be, of December, we're going to be restarting our Mornings with Mommy program. Uh, with a uh, special Christmas themed event, a Jesus birthday party. Uh, that's for all parents of kids five or under. So keep that in mind if, if you have kids that age. Uh, as many people as we can get from the congregation, that's just helpful to help build a good program. You might recall we had just started to do this before COVID, and then COVID came. And uh, so it, it's a program that we're looking to build up. And the more involvement we can have, the more it's going to help build a program like that. If you have any friends with kids that age, uh, invite them to come along. I'll have uh, a postcard with a lot more details in the coming weeks in your bulletin that you can take home and share with friends or, or whatever. And if you want more copies, I can get them for you. Um, yeah, that's, that's everything I've got. Does anybody else have any announcements they would like to share? Bob? So with the joy of welcoming our newest member, reminded me that we do have a church directory, and if you want a copy of it, we'll find one somewhere. And otherwise, I can always print another one off. But we have had several new members that I should probably get pictures of, so I can update that directory. I just keep it on the computer, but I print it out and I need it. So uh, maybe next Sunday or soon we could 
to do some updating would be great. You and I will talk, and then we can we can talk to anybody that involves. I know that would include David. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, so anybody else? Any? I thank you. And then anybody else any announcements to share? Seeing none, other than my children. <laughs> Great to worship with you today. God bless you this week, and uh, we'll see you on the way out. Also, there's some cookies and things like that, so make sure you help yourself to that.